This is The Saucer Life, a podcast in which we examine concepts, events, or people orbiting the world of flying saucers. Few preconceptions, snark when justified, no belief, no debunking. In this episode, we're going to examine one of the goofiest things to come out of ufology in the late 1990s, the 1997 video Area 51, the alien interview, which featured footage of an alien being interrogated and the voice-distorted shadowy figure of Victor. Heavily featured in the video was Sean David Morton, who had many appearances on Coast to Coast AM over the years. We'll talk a little bit about Morton, because you can't avoid it, and I'm not doing an entire Sean David Morton episode, so this might be all the Morton I ever talk about. I urge you, if you're interested in Sean David Morton, to go to ufowatchdog.com, which has an extensive exploration of the man's career, or just Google him. There's a lot out there, and some of it is quite amusing. But for now, let's get to this video. Area 51, the alien interview, was directed by Jeff Broadstreet and written by Robert Benson. And what I can gather, this was one of the first productions Broadstreet worked on following the writing and directing of 1989's film Sex Bomb, about which I know l- nothing. I know no- I was going to say I know little. I know nothing. Broadstreet has since gone on to produce, direct, and write a number of horror and suspense pictures. He was born in Greencastle, Indiana, either in 1954 or 1960. His IMDb page has both years listed, depending on where you look on the page. Uh, writer Benson had collaborated with Broadstreet on a number of projects and nothing else. Area 51, The Alien Interview, was released on VHS by Vega 7 Entertainment in 1997, running an hour and five minutes or so. Perhaps not shockingly, the website www.area51thealieninterview.com no longer seems to work, but thanks to the magic of the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine, we can find this site, which was set up in 2008 to sell Area 51, The Alien Interview, the 2008 edition. And from this website, we can get some background on exactly what this is. Basically, in 1996, a man identifying himself as Victor showed up claiming to possess irrefutable video proof that the government had captured a living extraterrestrial biological entity and was holding it at Area 51. He wanted the producers to make this footage Public, so that's what's going on, and Victor will be uh, Victor will be interviewed, and it's going to be the thing that finally breaks down the barriers of disclosure and reveals the truth about everything. There's also a link to a Wikipedia page about the video, which had been deleted in October 2009 as not being a notable enough topic. So let's get into this video. It begins with a disclaimer silently printed on screen. The following program deals with controversial subjects, it says. The theories, opinions, and beliefs expressed are not the only possible interpretation of the evidence. Viewers are urged to make a judgment based on all available information. Basically, this is a nice little compact statement saying, this isn't actually true, but we can't say it's not true. But if you believe it, that's on you, not us, because we're telling you to basically look at all sides and come to your own conclusions based on all available information. Do not sue us if it turns out this is a puppet in the video, right? Then we jump into some talking heads called from various points of the documentary, and we begin with Sean David Morton. It's a remarkable piece of footage. If it's a hoax, it's very well done. If it's some... Um... If it's not, then I would say it's probably revolutionary. And then we hear from the mysterious Victor, shrouded in darkness. If you continue to ask questions that are out of bounds, I won't hesitate to terminate this interview. 
Ooh, sinister. And then Robert O. Dean, which I got to say, whenever I would hear his name like on, on radio shows, I thought it was Robert O. Dean, like O apostrophe Dean. So it wasn't until I saw it in print that I realized it was an initial. That's probably because I'm dumb. So Robert O. Dean, he was a retired command sergeant major in the U.S. Army who claimed to have viewed classified government documents about the alien cover-up because they just leave these things lying around because a lot of people have seen various documents over the years about this. Um, We'll be doing a Bob Dean episode at some point in the future because he's totally episode worthy. This is powerful because this is not a staged event. This is real. From there, we meet our host, Stephen Williams, not the pro wrestler, Dr. Death Steve Williams, not the pro wrestler, Steve Williams, who had to change his name to Steve Austin because there was already a Steve Williams in wrestling when he started, but rather the actor who portrayed X, the second of Agent Mulder's several morally ambiguous informants on the X-Files. He tells us that if the footage contained in this video is genuine, then this is the most important thing in the history of mankind. As with all documentaries like this, they sort of assume the people buying it don't know anything about anything UFO related, which, which might be true, but I think it was mostly enthusiasts buying this sort of thing. In any case, we get a fairly lengthy rundown of the whole Area 51 saga with a different narrator rather than Williams, who was sort of presenting it. Then Williams is back and tells us about Bob Lazar's 1989 revelations about the facility and about the supposed efforts to back-engineer alien craft, including recycled Bob Lazar footage from various years past documentaries and news reports. We get similar tales from David Adair, a former NASA consultant who claimed he was brought in to study the engines of a flying saucer in 1971. And now... We meet Sean David Morton. He's shown walking around the edge of a lake or a pond at a park where families are enjoying the sunshine, and he's wearing a suit, and he looks vaguely lost and out of place. He, he looks like an executive out on his lunch hour who's just sort of milling around because nobody wants to hang out with him. So he's just hanging out at the park or something. It's, it's actually kind of strange. Ufologist and lecturer Sean David Morton has appeared on Sightings, Strange Universe, and Hard Copy. He offers his own perspective on Lazar's stunning claim and the super-secret Area 51. So one of the things that Robert Lazar told us was that if we simply went out to a black mailbox at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday nights, that we would actually see flying saucers, that these objects would test, and that this was the military testing time between 6.30 and 9.30, and then early in the morning between about 3 a.m. and about 6 a.m. And so Morton did just that. He, He went out to explore Area 51, and he shared this knowledge with the public. Well, actually, share is the wrong word. The May 2nd, 1993 edition of the Orange County Register tells us all about it in a story with the headline, Mysterious Earthlings Scour the Desert for Space Alien Tourists. It is twilight, and Sean David Morton is driving 90 miles per hour through the Nevada desert, headed for a dimension where unearthly flashes appear in the sky, and the lone local bar serves alien burgers and a cocktail called the Beam Me Up Scotty. He's hurtling toward a sector where he says extraterrestrials prowl the earth, surgically mutilating cows, conspiring with the U.S. military, and watching late-night TV. He is entering the terrifying Area 51. NASA's a fake. The real stuff is out here, he says. In the back of his rented van are seven wide-eyed passengers, a few of them alarmed by the warp speed at which Morton is driving. Each has paid $99 to see the flying saucers that Morton says spin through the desert at night. The fee also entitles them to an earful of the self-proclaimed prophet's arcane tidbits about space travel and government cover-ups, which he spews forth with a lunar gleam in his eye and a touch of sweat beneath his fedora. Casually, in a tone you'd use to explain that your Aunt Mavis is from Wisconsin, he explains that Area 51's aliens are probably from Krondak, a planet 800 light-years away. They're actually bluish-gray and a little bigger than most people think. They're three to four feet tall. Morton admits he's never actually seen any aliens in the flesh, but his sources tell him they're living at Area 51. Little men with the smooth heads and the wraparound eyes. 
Hidden here is the technology to end all wars, to end hunger, to provide an endless supply of energy, he said. I'm outraged that they're not showing it to the rest of the world. UFO might just as well stand for unprecedented financial opportunity. We also learn a little bit about Morton's background. Morton, 34, makes his living as a psychic, a healer, a predictor of earthquakes, and a screenwriter. He just finished a book of prophecy for the next 30 years. He also worked on TV shows about Area 51 for the NBC series Unsolved Mysteries, and for Geraldo Rivera's Now It Can Be Told. Morton says he was raised in a fundamentalist Christian family of the most rabid variety, but became a New Age thinker after a spiritual quest that took him from Texas to Tibet and various points in between. My mother thinks I'm nuts. She thinks I'm the Antichrist, he said. She has a publishing company, and she won't even publish my book. Yeah, because what all respected authors really want is for their mommy to publish their book for them. Um, Mom shows surprising good sense with that. So what do people see when they go on a flying saucer field trip with Sean David Morton? Suddenly, Morton swings the van off the road, kills the headlights, and leaps into the road screaming, Look! 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 Over there! 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 What the hell's that? Oh, it's gone. The fellow travelers run down the berm behind him. There are lights all over the sky. Some look like helicopters, some like flares, some like F-16s. Two huge planes, probably B-1s, swoop close overhead in the dark, barely making a sound, and something else seems to hopscotch across the sky, leaving an orange flash at each stop. You just saw tiny space jumps, Morton declares. So, basically, for $99, you get a long van ride in the dark with a guy who's gotten pretty good at pretending to see things in the sky. So that's Morton's qualifications for being in this video. He's an Area 51 guy from way back. Now, our host Stephen Williams tells us that some researchers think that secret parts of the government are in contact with alien beings, then throws to Sean for more detail. Project Sigma was supposedly a deal between the United States government and various extraterrestrials that after the Roswell crash of 1947, that an organization called Majestic 12 was formed, and then in 1953, President Eisenhower was then brought in on this. Well, there was a negotiation going back and forth between the United States military, the government, and the extraterrestrials. Apparently, we had a number of things that the extraterrestrials wanted. Number one, the military needed hardware. We wanted technology, we wanted weapons technology, propulsion technology, metallurgy technology, and in exchange for this, the ETs were willing to trade us uh, their hardware for our software, and software namely being us. What they primarily wanted was genetic material, and in exchange for that, they were willing to give us certain, certain technological uh, advances, like a number of flying saucers. I mean, this is a story that we've heard a lot. Uh, it, 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 was, it was the narrative from the late 80s on. We're going to see more of, of that sort of, we made a deal with the aliens and, and, and blah, blah, blah in this documentary. But now we get to the meat of the story, the supposed interview with the alien and, and where it came from. It was sourced from Area 51. Stephen Williams tells us, and it was smuggled out. And then the narrator takes over as action shifts to the offices of Rocket Pictures. On Friday, July 26th, 1996, the offices of Rocket Pictures, a producer distributor of motion pictures and television programs, received a phone call. A male voice, identifying himself only as Victor, claimed to be in possession of a videotaped interview with an extraterrestrial being. They show Victor silently. He's sitting in the shadows, but you can tell he has longish hair and a full beard that looks a little unkempt. I mean, if you can tell a beard is messy from a shadow, it's probably unkempt, you know? In fact, it's so noticeable that I believe this is part of the disguise. The president of Rocket Pictures, Tom Coleman, was, the narrator says, intrigued enough to take Victor's call. He said he had a tape of a space alien, an ET, that was being held in a, a, a military installation in Nevada. Uh, I'm not sure as a prisoner or a guest. Um, and uh, he had this on tape. 
Then we get more alien history lesson as the narrator fills us in on other contacts, the most famous of which was, he says, Roswell, which was where we got the alien autopsy footage, he says. We also learn about EBE-1, who was captured in 1949. He suffered from chronic health problems, which were untreatable. The source for this info was a top-secret briefing document, which explained that EBE-1 was interviewed via a series of pictographs, which led to the development of a new language with which we could communicate with them. Despite this, experts agree that aliens mainly communicate via thought transmission, and all of this comes from this briefing document is the Aquarius briefing document, which... That goes all the way back to Benowitz and Bill Moore and, and, and Doty back in the early 1980s. And this has contributed so much to the mythos of all of this over the years, as we've seen repeatedly in the five years we've been doing this show. So they do have reproductions of these scenes where EBE-1 is being interviewed and everything. And they're in black and white. And, and it's really pretty well done and entertaining. And now we get celebrity host Stephen Williams back explaining the history of UFO secrecy, MJ-12, and so on. And there's just so much UFO backstory here. We're a quarter of the way through this thing. And we've gotten very little information about this supposed tape and a whole lot of John Lear-flavored conspiracy theories. And we even get references to Falcon who revealed that EBE-2 was held at Area 51, which became, according to the narrator, a sort of alien embassy. So it's just there's a lot of filler here that honestly I believe anybody who would have been buying this tape in 1997 would have already been up on. Um, and was, they were probably getting bored at this point. But You've got to fill this thing out to be at least an hour to make it worth people's money. So you do a a lot of sort of padding things like this. So how does Victor fit into all of this? We'll find out after this brief break. If you like The Saucer Life and want more, you can support us in exchange for a whole array of bonus content. Patrons get the episodes before everybody else, and and there's a few pieces of bonus content every month. Recently, uh, we did a watch-along of the movie Euphoria with the late Cindy Williams, and uh, that was fun. That was a a good a, a good movie. I recorded some commentary for that. It, it sounds like it'll be a cheesy movie. Uh, there's aliens coming. This woman has a vision that aliens are coming and, and everything. And you think it's going to be cheesy and bad, but, but actually I unironically enjoyed it. So if you're interested, you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com slash cheesomedia or via the link in the show notes. You can also check out past episodes of the show at saucerlife.com or your favorite podcast app. As always, we're on Twitter and Instagram at saucerlife, and you can email us at thesaucerlife at gmail.com. You can also contact us by post at Media, P.O. Box 68, Grand Blank, Michigan, 484 Eight zero. So we had some feedback uh, about uh, our Laura Mundo episode last time. And as usual, uh, you, you all are the, the most insightful bunch of listeners in podcast land, I'm convinced. Uh, Stuart Lloyd on Patreon um, said, you already mentioned that you think a lot of this story is based on Laura working through her issues, and I agree. At the risk of sounding Freudian and or Jungian, we have a divorced single mother of two boys writing about a greater power and calling it the father, maybe to make up for the missing father in the boys' lives. Laura calling Adamski Lucifer and saying that Orthon prefers to live as a woman could be interpreted as rage toward the men who have wronged her in her life and her embracing the sacred feminine. I expect women in the 1960s probably had to not show too much anger lest they get branded psycho or crazy and possibly even shipped off. However, writing what most people interpreted as fiction was probably the only outlet she had. El Bardo made a connection that I didn't think of, but it does seem kind of intriguing. This might be kind of niche, but I'm going for it anyhow. I find a lot of commonalities between the gang-stalked types and the abductees, but Laura's contactee story has so many more overlaps with the modern narratives by targeted individuals than most of her contemporaries. 
Her interaction with the UFO sending her information is very not unlike the electronic harassment reported by targeted individuals. Her preoccupation with hateful gossip going on behind her back is also part of their whole thing. Orthon even functions as the stalker par excellence. Disguises, unspoken connections, and someone important to you, Adamski, also knowing about the stalking. Laura obviously has a different, more positive relationship with her, I'm going to say it, delusions, than the average targeted individual, but regardless, they feel worth pointing out. Yeah, I, I never thought about the the overlap with, with targeted individuals, but she does seem to have this sort of hypervigilance about – uh, the relationships going on around her and how those might or might not be breaking down. A commenter, Flying Lemon, on the website uh, said, while her statement about Orthon semi-encouraging homosexual conversion therapy certainly hasn't aged well, and her increasingly paranoia about people acting against her is troubling, I'm absolutely fascinated by her interpretation of Orthon as a gender-fluid individual. Yes, I I agree. That was... That was something I was not expecting, and I found a very refreshing kind of uh, kind of take on on all of that. I I was very very uh, very very interesting. Another commenter on the website, uh, Matthew, said Miss Mundo was a fascinating, if not misguided, individual. Her goal of being viewed as intelligent and scholarly is evident right from the start in her introduction of Ms. Falzone. She spoke of Ms. Falzone as I imagine anthropologists of yore spoke of lost tribes, tinged with judgment and an inflated sense of enlightenment and self. As I think you alluded to as well, I suspect Mundo hoped the lack of editing would convey how even Falzone of low culture, so simple of mind and altogether unworldly, still understood the plan. Yeah, I I thought she she did Falzone poorly there. Um, Yeah, definitely sort of a superiority thing going on um red pill junkie also uh, commenting on the website said perhaps mundo's weird feelings regarding the link between reincarnation and fingerprints is somewhat related to frank strange's allusion to valiant thor and how he described his hands to be perfectly smooth thus connecting fingerprints as being a record of one's sins or something like that as for orthon showing a duck-tailed pompadour and dressing in the zoot suit fashion this is a mental image I will never be able to get rid of from now on. You and I both. We had some emails as well with uh, one emailer uh, saying that he would like more extensive biographies of the uh, of the contactees before their contact experiences began. I would love to be able to do that as well. There's a there's not a lot of of sources for a lot of these these contactees, but uh, I try to find. As much stuff as I, I can that's that's relevant. And also he wondered if there had ever been any psych profiling done of some of these contactees to sort of flesh out their their motivations and 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 possible uh, you know issues that might have led to them you know engaging in this behavior. I'm not I'm not sure of any. Um, not that I've not that I've come across, but if you find any, please let us know. Uh, also in email, um, our frequent commenter uh, Lester wants to know if um, well, what brand of cigarettes Orthon preferred. Lucky Strike. I don't, I don't know. I just made that up. And uh, he says, I hope Mundo voted for Gabe Green. And also. Lester says, I was on Laura Mundo's mailing list briefly before she died. She was still defending Adamski. He groped her on stage to identify the space aliens in the office, not because he was a sexist perv. Yeah, Adamski had some issues with women at times, sort of hinted at uh, slightly in, in various uh, various documents. The Patreon bonus episode this uh, this month is going to be uh, basically Mundo Mania. There's some more um, Laura Mundo stuff out there, including some con- comments about Adamski and his uh, his rampant misogyny. And finally, um, an email from uh, from Gabriel McKee, uh, who is uh, working on a book about Gray Barker, which is very exciting. And he has some uh, some tidbits about this from his research that uh, that I wasn't aware of. Um, one is that the uh, the agency that 
Mundo claims contacted her, the government agency, and I, I found this in a book after I finished the episode. She claimed it was the U.S. Information Agency. And Gabriel points out that basically you remember the whole Straith letter thing, the the fake letter on government a, government stationery that Gray Barker stole that he sent letters sort of hoax letters to various ufologists and that stationery was from the u.s information agency so um and there is a copy of that letter in barker's files gabriel says so that's yeah yeah so that's where that comes from and he's also a pretty sure thing that the guy who claimed to be a man in black at the detroit saucer convention was gabriel believes that is probably jim mosley uh so uh yeah there's uh there's that as well and as funny as all that is, a lot of times, boy, uh, Barker and Mosley, just sometimes I can't sort of shake the fact th- these guys really were a couple of jerks <laughs> a lot of times. But um, that's what uh, that's what we have from the uh, from the mailbag for that episode. And let's get back to the documentary. <laughs> Victor, what's his deal? Is he a hoaxer, a government dupe, or a frightened whistleblower with the hard evidence to back up his story? Tom Coleman, head of Rocket Pictures, reported that Victor encouraged Rocket to test and verify him and his evidence however they liked. His only concern was that his identity was kept secret. Now, the narrator does confirm that not only is he in shadow, but in disguise as well. So, yeah, it's hard to tell anything from the face and hair because that's that's all that's all fake. We then get the information that Victor was very reluctant to appear on film. And in my opinion, one of the best things about this whole video is the fact that Victor is often really irritated by things and a bit petulant. In fact, we get a taste of that in the first interview clip with him that they present. What is your occupation at Area 51? I won't answer that. I have had reason to be present at Area 51, but I'm not going to clarify whether or not I was there as an employee. Are you saying you were there as a visitor? I'm not going to specify why or in what capacity I was there. Only that I was there. Can you tell us how many times you were there? When I agreed to this, my fundamental ground rule was that I would not be asked to divulge personal data that might help pinpoint my identity. If you continue to ask questions that are out of bounds, I won't hesitate to terminate this interview. Are you saying that the number of times you were present at Area 51 is enough to pinpoint your identity? Any specifics will narrow the field of suspects. Of course, I could lie. Let's say I've been there 47 times. It's a nice touch, and it does a lot to reinforce the idea that Victor is somebody with something to lose. We also learn more about the actual tape. Let's turn to the tape itself. The copy you've supplied is not the original tape. No. Was the original at Area 51 when you copied it? That's out of bounds. Is it fair to assume that the copying of tapes at Area 51 is heavily restricted? You can assume anything you like. I would say that's a fair assumption. That's obvious. I will say that this tape was copied under special circumstances. Otherwise, copying it would have been impossible. Can you be more specific, Victor? More specific? Okay, I'm sure they've figured this much out already. Recently, there was a wholesale transfer of video documentation from analog tape to digital disk storage. In a couple of instances, this allowed data to leak from a highest security system to a less high security system. Even so, this particular tape was the only... I think that's about all I'll say about that. So then the interviewer, which, as you can tell, is a different voice, again, from Stephen Williams or the narrator. They really could have cut the budget down a little bit by combining some of those roles, I think. The narrator keeps persisting in trying to find out as much about the videotape digitalization security process as he can. Was there something about this particular clip that made it more accessible to be copied? Not necessarily, no. Was there something about the content that caused them to file it differently or give it special handling? 
This interview was terminated. Okay, just a little personal secret of mine. It is my goal at some point, if I'm ever interviewed on podcasts again, to utter those very words. This interview is terminated. And I want to make sure it is after one of the most innocuous questions ever. So, Aaron, how did you get into the whole UFO feel? This interview is terminated. I just, I mean, I have very modest (laughs) ambitions. We learned that the interview resumed after a review of the ground rules. And again, I need to register my approval of, of this whole angle. Victor is spiky. He's uncomfortable. He knows that he has what these video production people want. And he gives the impression that he's playing with them a bit. When Victor returns, he confirms that he had met the alien on one or more occasions. He refuses to give an exact number, but he denies that he was present for the interview we're about to see. Now we get down to some of the details of the interview itself. What can you tell us about the alien interview we're about to see? This one is rather recent, very late in the series. The interview process has been ongoing since the being arrived, which was in 1989. Approximately twice a month, they sit it down for a session that generally lasts from three to five hours. If they try to go longer than that, or if they schedule the sessions more frequently, the being becomes unresponsive. There's a fair amount of infighting among the scientists from different disciplines to get their questions asked. Okay, so the alien gets tired, and there's a limited amount of time to get questions answered. So what have we learned so far, if anything? various minor technical details of the saucers. The physicists and engineers are frankly frustrated. They feel the being is withholding information. Possibly concepts are getting lost because all the information has to come through a telepath. But also it may be that the bulk of their scientific knowledge is just too advanced to be translated into our primitive conceptual framework. It's analogous to if a human scientist were to try to translate quantum mechanics into the grunts and screeches of a chimpanzee. That's not a very flattering comparison. Frankly, there's a high attrition rate for scientists in the program. You'd think they'd be energized by the challenge. But a lot of them take uh, the ego deflation very hard when they find out not only how much they don't know, but how much they aren't even capable of understanding. So I'm sure people who are more up on the Area 51 stuff than I am could explain this to me. But I'm uncertain exactly what's going on here. So we've had their craft and technologies since the 1940s. We've worked deals to get technical assistance from them. But in the mid to late 1990s, we're hearing now scientists at Area 51 are frustrated to the point of quitting because we can't understand that technology. That doesn't seem to to balance out. And then you have books like The Day After Roswell, which claim that pretty much every piece of technology that's been developed in the last 70 years had its roots in alien technology and and back engineering and things like that. So where does that fit in? There, There are some plot continuity issues here. But maybe the technical side of things isn't the most important factor in play, as Victor explains. The alien, he says, has an easier time communicating spiritual concepts. We then move to a recreation of one of the interview sessions, this time in color rather than black and white. And the voice we hear here is presumably the psychic who is relaying the alien's thought messages. The the human body is a vehicle, um, a vessel. And the vessel must be maintained to serve this, the spirit. With maximum efficiency. But a broken vessel can be replaced. The human spirit, or the soul, can have many vessels. Is the process natural or technological? Both are, uh, both are one. Technology is a natural excrescence of humanity. Technology is a, is, is a process the vessel uses to perfect itself. That is all much clearer. Thank you. 
Victor explains that the aliens see the physical body as a disposable container for the soul. And the the narrator connects this concept to the beliefs of the Heaven's Gate cult. We get a rundown of the mass suicide and confirm that Victor – and they note that Victor was interviewed before the Heaven's Gate suicide. Victor is very attached to his physical form. And let me just state here publicly to head off any clever ideas anyone might be having. I have never been, am not now, and never will be suicidal. But how would the public know if something happened to you since we don't know who you are? I'm taking care of that. Trust me. If something happens to me, if I die, people will know who I am. To be honest, the Heaven's Gate references they put in there just seem like padding. None of this has anything to do with Heaven's Gate or those ideas. It's there, there's barely any connection at all besides the idea that that we're containers for souls, which isn't a Heaven's Gate exclusive idea. I, I think just the timing of it made it a, you know, a a thing that you would talk about just to make it clear that you are you know aware of what's of what's going on. We get more discussion of whether or not we can ever really communicate with aliens beyond the basic level at which humans communicate with animals, for example. And Victor does not believe we can fully trust the aliens given this differential in intellect and abilities. The narrator explains that since Victor won't reveal his identity, his credibility relies entirely on the authenticity of the tape. And now – It's time to see the entirety of the tape shown in real time. There's some background music added. Listen to it. It's spacey. Yeah, it's that. And that is the only sound on this video. We don't know what questions are being asked. We don't know what the alien is saying through the psychic. All we do is hear that music. And we see a stereotypical gray alien seated at one end of the table. It looks about like the models used for the reconstructed scenes of the interview, maybe a little less detailed. The eyes are deep, black, and glossy. You can see light reflected off of them, almost like it's a plastic surface. And one thing that's interesting that I, I noted in some of the, the online commentary about it from the time that there wasn't a lot, a lot less than I, than I expected, was there were several people saying no lights reflecting off those eyes. It's like they're absorbing the light. That makes me think it might be real. No, you can see the light reflecting off the eyes. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. So anyway. The room is dark in general with two squarish bluish light sources in the background that might be reflections because it looks like we're looking through a plate of glass, like maybe a two-way mirror into the room. There's a tiny bit of light illuminating the surface of the table the alien is sitting at and the head and shoulders of the alien, but nothing below that. Like I said, there's, there's no sound apart from the music. The alien moves his head from side to side, up and down, and there's a green light, like a vertical line pulsing up and down, sort of near the alien's shoulder or chest area. At the bottom of the screen is is text DNI slash 27, which we'll get to in a bit. And there's a time code indicating we're on the fourth hour of this particular recording. It goes on for a while uh, with just You don't hear anything except the music and the alien sort of bobbing and weaving his head around. And then another figure enters the room from the right side of the screen and two figures in medical garb appear behind the alien. They're shining a light in his eyes, wiping his face. The alien appears to be in some kind of distress. And at this point, since we don't really know what anyone is saying, it's hard to tell. Now, back in the studio, Victor explains why the sound was removed from the video. That's correct. I can't allow the voices of the project personnel to be heard by the general public. There's a very good chance their family or friends on the outside might recognize them. We also learn why Victor is doing all of this. My purpose is to expose the existence of the aliens, not compromise these individuals. I made the decision to come forward. 
I'm taking precautions to protect my own identity, and I don't think it's fair for me to put these others in danger of exposure. Victor also tells us a little bit about what we're seeing on the video, since honestly, it's not entirely clear. Although it seems like they could have had his commentary on it the first time they showed the video, but it's like they needed to pad things out a little bit. This is the most interesting part, I think. The alien is seated behind a glass partition in a biocontainment area, which is maintained at biosafety level 2, the lowest uh, designation. That's primarily for the uh, protection of the aliens, not us. The theory is that uh, if they were going to infect us with an alien bug, it would have happened 50 years ago. Um, In fact, uh, all the indications are the aliens eliminated microbial and viral life from their own ecosystem long ago. They aren't susceptible to our diseases directly, but it has been shown that microbes can reproduce and form colonies within their respiratory systems, which tends to exacerbate the debilities they seem to suffer anyway in our environment. So that's why the alien is going into distress and needs the emergency attention. Also, completely eliminating bacteria and microbes from an ecosystem sounds like about the dumbest thing you can do. It's not just disease. Okay, not going to get into that. He also, and I I enjoyed this, complains about the quality of the medical personnel at Area 51. Uh, The medical staff should be there by now. They're, They're slow in responding. There they are. I have to say, the medical personnel at S4 are less than first rate. They tend to be selected for their willingness to keep secrets rather than their medical competence. Victor then gets a bit emotional and says that it's it's very hard to watch this. And, and I, yes, I agree. Watching people manhandle a puppet is very troubling. There, there's that snark when justified for you. Next, we move to the is it real portion of the show. Tom Coleman of the uh, the video company doesn't know if it's real or not but he thinks that it's not a goofy trick like the alien autopsy film. They go into the technical details of the tape, talking to Jim Delatoso, who I'd first heard of as someone who evaluated pictures of Mars for Richard Hoagland. So that's not a mark in his favor, in my opinion. We get lots of talk about digitalizing tapes and comparing the digital images to the analog images. The results are inconclusive, which, of course, is interpreted as that doesn't mean it's fake. But none of this matters because Delatoso has an emotional response to our little alien friend. He took the tape very seriously and offered this personal opinion. If someone faked this, I don't like these people. I think it's a bad thing for people to do because if extraterrestrials come here, it's an incredibly important thing to understand who they are and why are they coming here. If this is not faked, I think we've got a glimpse here of a sense of of communication with someone who came from a long distance away. David Adair, the back engineering saucer engine expert whistleblower, uh, doesn't know much, doesn't know if this is real or fake, but he knows that he's seen an alien spacecraft engine, so the tape might be true because clearly we have spacecraft. We then talk to a prop expert who thinks it's a fake, but a really high-quality one, way better than the alien autopsy film. There are a number of digs at the alien autopsy film uh, in this in this uh, this video, and he thinks that uh, the way mo- that most of the alien prop was hidden in shadow was a good move because it makes it less obvious that it's a prop. But the fact that they lit it like that is a clue that it's a prop because they wouldn't have lit it in such a mysterious shadowy way if it was just an internal archival thing where they wanted this this interview. We also hear from the makeup expert who worked on the Eddie Murphy Nutty Professor movie and the movie Men in Black, who says that it's clearly a puppet, and he comments on the shadowy lighting as being a tell as well. But people who know actual stuff aren't interesting, so we need to go to Bob Dean for his, in their words, expert opinion. We see him in profile, hand on chin, looking intently at the screen. Doug, treating him like a piece of livestock, wiping his lips, that breaks my heart. I think you've got yourself 
a piece of legitimate footage here, and I think you've got your hands on some pretty sensitive material. I don't know how the hell you got this. I don't know who you got it from, and frankly, I don't want to know who you got it from. But you got yourself a tiger by the tail with this footage. I would say, and I know that that's one of the things you ask of me, is that you've got yourself some legitimate footage of one of the little guys being interrogated and filmed. And there's a reality to it, and there's a sensitivity to it that literally breaks my heart. But I tell you very much, very strongly, you've got something here that is very sensitive. Well, I know that the level of classification on this kind of a thing is so far damned above top secret that you won't even, you can't imagine how sensitive this kind of thing is and how delicate it is and how tightly the government sits on anything like this. And, of course, we hear from Sean David Morton. Sean Morton looked for clues to the tape's authenticity in the technical details of the interview setting. Okay, there's a, a couple of interesting things about the tape right off the bat. Morton tried to decipher the time code at the bottom of the screen. First off, what you're looking at in the time code is DNI's Department of Naval Intelligence. So Department of Naval Intelligence, this would, this would probably be a file number 27. It could be a security level, however. Um, because security levels are supposedly go up to uh, Q36, or the highest ones that we know about. The first interesting thing about that is that I'm noticing uh, uh, what looks like a medical monitor, and look at how slowly and erratic the heartbeat is. The heartbeat is literally one, two. It's very, very erratic, and it looks as though the the heartbeat being as erratic as it is is only about. Um, from counting that, it looks like a, it, it's about 30 a, a minute or so. Uh, one of the unusual things about the uh, about most of these particular race of aliens is they are very very sensitive to light. So a lot of these interviews are conducted in um, uh, in very darkened rooms. Okay. As far as I can tell, there is no Department of Naval Intelligence in the U.S. Navy. There is an Office of Naval Intelligence. If you Google it, you get a lot of hits for Office of Naval Intelligence, and you also get hits for uh, the Wikipedia uh, page uh, for Naval Intelligence Division. It says Naval Intelligence Division or Department of Naval Intelligence may refer to – it has seven entries um, for various naval intelligence operations around the world, none of which are called Department of Naval intelligence. Someone online suggested that DNI stood for Digital NATO Inventory, uh, which also makes little sense. And, and his talk about the heart rate. Why do we assume the Greys have a circulatory system like ours? I mean, a lot of the things you'd read about the Greys back in the day uh, said they had no internal organs at all, or their internal organs were unidentifiable to us. And also, even if they do have a circulatory system like ours, who's to say that their heart rates aren't erratic normally or what we consider erratic normally? Morton goes on to describe the video as we yet again watch it. So I think they run through the video at least three full times. We also hear from Whitley Strieber, kind of. He refused, they say, to appear in the documentary. So we get – what he said on the TV show Strange Universe about Victor. And I tried to find that episode of Strange Universe. I, I couldn't. But if somebody out there with better, um, better skills with the Google machine can find it, um, you know, let me know. So they couldn't – probably couldn't license the actual footage. So instead, we just have Streber's words superimposed on the screen over a grainy picture of him, which looks so low rent. He said, apparently, because we can't check it out, um, he said, I hadn't realized until I saw this how familiar it would be. If this is a fake, it's really good. It's very difficult to watch this because somebody who made this knows something about the way they move. I hope to God it's a fake because if it's not, I'm so ashamed for mankind. We also get some clips from Victor and Sean's May 1997 appearance on Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. We'll get to that in a bit. 
And we close with more from Victor. He tells us that even though taking money for this project may cast doubt on it, he could have made much more money if he'd compromised his anonymity. And we hear from Robert Odeen one final time, who talks in fairly generic terms about the fact that we have back-engineered alien technology, and he calls for disclosure. We get some more footage of the alien in distress and some victor. Did this alien die? I can't answer that with certainty. I do know the interviews came to an end. Whether the being died or was retired, and I don't mean that in the spy thriller sense of having it killed, I mean retired from the interview process. I just don't know. I'm fairly certain it didn't go home, at least not in the physical sense. But these beings, they don't seem to be very concerned about dying or avoiding death. Why do you think that is? Maybe they know what comes after death with more confidence than we do. Maybe there's another vessel waiting for them on the other side. The other side? Yes, which may in fact be where they come from in the first place. Uh, I've heard the claims that they come from Zeta Reticula or the Pleiades, but it hasn't been established that they come from out there at all. Their saucers may not travel through space as we know it. They may fold in from another dimension, another reality. You make them sound almost supernatural, like angels or devils. Supernatural is just a term for aspects of nature we don't understand. For many people, they certainly do serve the functions of both angels and devils, forces, forces we can't comprehend. Have you had enough of me? I, I think I've earned my money. Okay. Have you had enough of me? I, I think I've earned my money. Is going to be how I respond at the end of every work meeting from now on. So, as stated... In May 1997, Sean David Morton and Victor appeared on Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. For the most part, it's a recap or actually technically a preview of what appears in the video with far less detail because they're trying to sell the video, you know, and they've got a still shot of the alien up on the Coast to Coast AM website so listeners can go check it out while they're listening to the interview. Track it down because it's really good. And my favorite thing about it is when they're trying to get Victor on the line, there's a bit of a mix up with the, the phone numbers. And as you might expect, Victor was none too pleased. This is a longer clip, but it's worth it, I think. Uh, here we go, I think. Uh, let's see if we've got Victor on the line. Victor, are you there? I'm here. Uh, welcome to the program, Victor. Yes, I think it's fair to say at this moment I'm incensed. Uh, this snafu with the telephone numbers. Can I ask you who is at your studio at this time? Well, I'm here. Uh, and other. Uh, uh, no, uh, my wife is. Um, my wife is here, of course. I, I I do my broadcast from home, Victor. And other than myself and my wife, there's nobody. Ah. Uh, well, I can. I would. Just at this moment, I believe that 45 minutes from now, I will have finished my last public pronouncement because this, uh, this business with Jeff and the, the phone numbers is not part of the agreement. Well, Victor, it was just a problem because somebody wrote a 7 instead of a 1. That's, that's you know, it was just a, a simple mistake. All right. Yeah. Well, we're sorry. Yeah, we are sorry, and it was just a simple mistake is exactly correct. Uh, Victor? Uh, who, who is that second voice? I'm sorry, this is Sean Morton. How are you, sir? Oh, Mr. Morton. Nice to talk to you. Yes. yes. Uh, if, if you can, Victor, we would like to both probably uh, ask you some questions if we can. Uh, obviously, if you can't answer a question, you let us know, and, uh, you know, we'll back away. Um, By the way, uh, by the way, uh, Mr. Morton? Yes, sir. John Morton, I, I have come into possession of your Delphi Associate newsletter dated yes. April 11th, yes. 1997, and I, and I have to say this is how misinformation proliferates. I don't know where you got your information about what I have stated to the rocket people. But there are a number of statements here that are that are incorrect. Okay, well maybe we should start there because I tried to check everything with Jeff. All I all I had was Mr. Broad. Yes, Mr. Broadstreet. He has uh, successfully prevented me from prescribing myself a double bushmel for nerves. I frankly, well, let's leave that. 
that darn Jeff Broadstreet not letting Victor get drunk before going on the air with Art Bell. So, who was Victor? A lot of people um, online and in various places are pretty convinced that based on the footage, it was Robert O. Dean. And I can I can see that. Um, the hair, the beard seemed to match, although they said Victor was wearing a disguise, but it's still it's still the silhouette looks looks kind of like him. There was some talk that uh, Dean and Victor were wearing identical ties. We're wearing the same tie uh, on the shoot. But the more I look at it, the more I think they are very similar. It's a um, it's a, a dark tie with a diagonal gold stripe. But I think I think uh, there was a, a difference in the the width of the stripe, so I'm not sure about that. The voice doesn't sound um, much like Dean's. The other option that people have talked about was Whitley Strieber, and that was my guess before I even knew that other people thought that too. Just when I first heard this years and years and years ago, the Art Bell thing, which was long before I actually watched the video. Just something about the, uh, the, the the cadence, the the emphasis on words, there's just the, the pattern of speaking. It seemed very similar to Streber. And watching the video, um, the connection uh, and the discussion of the aliens' conceptions of life after death and the soul and and death and that transition being a significant thing, that's very Streberian. Um, whereas, at least in this video, Dean talked mostly about the um, the technology stuff. And uh, Victor was more focused on the spiritual aspects, which, which made it feel more like a Streber thing to me. Actually, years and years ago, when Twitter first started, I got on Twitter and and I asked Whitley Strieber if he was um, he was Victor, and he replied within minutes to me. And I, I wish I still had that tweet. I've purged my tweets since then. But uh, he was mad. He was he was just irritated, and um, he he doesn't think highly of of hoaxes. And um, I didn't know. I, I think he blocked me. Um, pretty sure he blocked me after that. And uh, so I wasn't able to, to follow up with like, are you saying that you would never participate in a hoax or are you saying that the Victor thing was a hoax? Because I think there was some wiggle room on there. So Sean David Morton, um, like I said, go to ufowatchdog.com for a lot of uh, stuff about Sean David Morton. Um, he's been in the news relatively recently. Uh, he was indicted on securities fraud charges for his Delphi Associates newsletter, basically mismanaging um, mismanaging people's investments in uh, international international currencies. And then um, the way they get everybody tax uh, tax fraud. He defrauded the IRS. Basically, he and his wife claimed a bunch of uh, credits and deductions and overpayments that didn't exist. Uh, the IRS, you know, because they don't check everything at the time it comes in, issued a check for almost half a million dollars, which they immediately put in various accounts. Um, he was charged with 51 counts of issuing false instruments, four counts of filing false federal income tax documents, and one count of conspiracy to defraud the IRS. Um, the jury was uh, in deliberations for a whopping two hours before finding him guilty in uh, 2017 of 51 charges. And um, he was sentenced in uh, set, scheduled to be sentenced in June of 2017. Um, he failed to appear for his sentencing hearing, and a federal arrest warrant was issued. He was uh, I remember him posting YouTube videos talking about the deep state persecuting him while he was like driving down the interstate and things like that. Pretty entertaining stuff. Um, they caught him, and in September he was sentenced to six years in prison. 
in order to pay back the $480,322 to the Internal Revenue Service. Um, he was released from prison in 2021. Uh, he through his wife, who also served a uh, a sentence at the the uh, Correctional Institute institution of Victorville, California, um, is, posted regular or transmitted regular messages about how he was being mistreated and tortured by the evil people in the prisons because he's going to release the truth. He was uh, he said he was diagnosed with. Uh, with with severe cancer and that uh, it wasn't caught in time for his natural remedy of scorpion venom to work. And so he had to go fund me up for a while. Um, there are some some great long sort of rambly ranty things. Uh, if you go to the Project Camelot website, which I honestly don't recommend under most circumstances, but you can read how the deep state is targeting him for what he knows. Uh, Sean David Morton, um, not slander to say, Sean David Morton, convicted fraudster. And his uh, his Wikipedia entry is great because whoever edited this says, occupation, in the little info box, occupation, psychic, author, filmmaker, investor, confidence trickster, known for securities and tax fraud, not for Area 51, not for the Victor video, not for predicting the Northridge earthquake. Nope. What's he known for? Securities and tax fraud. And what were the opinions online like about this? I looked on the Usenet group Alt Alien Visitors. Not a lot of discussion on there about this that I could find. Mostly people just saying, anyone else think this is true? And there would be no replies in the thread. When the 10th anniversary video came out in 2008, there was a lot of talk on the Above Top Secret forum about it and about who Victor might be. There were um, attempts to de-distort the voice, uh, things like that. Lots of discussion and some, uh, some great posts on here, uh, such as this one. I am so confused about all of this and whether it was a hoax or not. God curse these hoaxers. God curse these hoaxers indeed. Now this poster uh, believed that everything seems to make sense. The fact that all of Victor's facts supposedly matched up and what he said was not typical. Rather, he said the alien couldn't explain technological things, but was more knowledgeable in spiritual concerns. I don't know for sure. It just doesn't seem typical, and the facts seem to match up. The fact that he wanted money negates the veracity of it. But to an extent, everything he says checks out. Timelines, places, people, reasons, and all that. The poster never actually goes into what facts check out. <laughs> Which is kind of weakens it. Um, and then there was somebody who wandered onto the thread, apparently um, not knowing that you don't have to comment on every thread that exists. Sorry for being ignorant, but who is Victor and John Dean? Well, John Dean was White House counsel for the uh, for the Nixon administration. I mean, come on, read a history book. And then there were others who thought this whole effort to determine Victor's identity was completely inappropriate. Honestly, I don't know why people are trying to find out Victor's identity. The purpose of him actually hiding who he was was for the dark government forces not to find him and possibly end his life for releasing such sensitive video. In reality, this effort for people to try and find out who he was and the Threads poster having everything chip into the investigation only makes it more suspicious on why exactly he's trying to find out Victor's identity and thus having intelligent minds contribute to this. Victor tried to spread truth to the world, knowing that such information and video could possibly end his life in some mysterious way, possibly reported as a suicide most likely. Is this the way we want to treat our anonymous sources? What's the point of sending such footage if critics are going to try and find out who you are, regardless on the lengths you try to take and protect yourself from possible harm? I say we try and drop this, forget who Victor is, and just ponder and question the footage itself. It's obvious people here don't care for this man's safety and identity for releasing this footage. To me, this thread is very suspicious. And why do you want to badly know who Victor is? 
all it would do is help dark forces in the government find this individual and erase him from the face of the planet. Way to go. So as we come to the end of all this, what's the deal with Victor and this whole thing? Well, here's my take on it, in case you want it. I think Victor was Whitley Strieber. I have no evidence of that, but I think that's who it was. I think it was largely a money-making operation. I think it was cynical exploitation of the popularity of the UFO scene in 1997. It's hard to, I mean, nowadays there's lots of UFO cash in stuff, but 97, you know, 50th anniversary of Roswell, there was a lot of this stuff going on. I will say the alien prop is incredibly well done. The movement is right. The lighting is is spooky, but then you've got the, well, their eyes are huge, so we've got to keep the lights down thing. I think that worked really well. I think the emotion from somebody like Bob Dean, you know, sort of lamenting how the alien is being treated, I think that's a great touch. I thought Victor as an interviewee was very well done. I, I think they hit just the right notes of of petulance and irritation and a little bit of uh, a little bit of fear of being exposed. This video is out on YouTube if you want to find it, but I encourage you to, if nothing else, find the coast to coast AM episode where uh, Morton and Victor are on with Art Bell because it is it is a trip. It's a it's a in my opinion a classic Art Bell episode. I can't stand listening to Sean David Morton. Um this is the only episode where he's on where I'm I'm not like sort of punching something wishing it was Sean Morton. Uh, for some reason he really annoy his voice just really grates on me, which I, I've got a terrible grating voice myself so I, I know I, I know how it feels it feels and i know there are people out there who would probably you know hate my voice as well but i'm just glad we can finally say um fraudster sean david morton without fear of um a libel lawsuit or a slander lawsuit in any case this is a phenomenal piece of ephemera from late 90s saucerology. And I, I think that's the way we have to look at it, not debating whether or not it's true or not, but instead trying to determine whether or not um, this has meaning for our understanding of the UFO field at the time. Um, it's a document from the history of of ufology, and I think that's the best way to look at it. Thanks for listening. Remember to send in your questions and comments via the usual social media or email channels, and we will address them next time. Our associate producer is Simpson J. Hanover III, and The Saucer Life is a production of Chizo Media, LLC. Chizo Media. Our heart is with the people. Till next time, keep watching the skies because the skies are watching you.